The second module of this class focuses on stratification and health and asks the question, what groups of people are most likely to be ill and which groups of people are most likely to remain healthy? I think your book and the readings actually do a pretty good job of explaining how stratification of health works and what that looks like. But I'd actually like to back up um, to talk about the basics of stratification for those students in the class who maybe need a refresher on this, who may not have taken a sociology course before. Um, so this part of this lecture is really going to focus on defining some of the main concepts and then walking through how stratification happens and what it actually look like, looks like in the U.S. So uh, to start, I'll just define um, the term stratification, which is the division of society, of people in society, into groups. And those groups are arranged into a social hierarchy, or you can think of a hierarchy as a, a ladder of sorts, where people at the top of the hierarchy have more access to scarce resources. So they have more access to food, money, housing, power, prestige. I mean, there are other resources you could discuss there. Um, what's interesting from a sociological perspective is that stratification is something that exists in all societies, primitive societies, modern societies, American society, societies of other countries. Every society has stratification, but it might differ in the characteristics of individuals that we use to stratify people. So we tend to believe, sometimes subconsciously, sometimes we explicitly buy into this idea that some groups are better than others, some groups are more deserving than others. Um, there's a commonly held belief in the U.S., for example, that people who are well off worked hard to get there, and people who are poor may be too lazy or not have a good work ethic, and that is what put them in their position in the first place. So we do uh, tend to believe that inequality as it exists is there for a reason, um, and it's those beliefs, now not everybody holds those beliefs, but enough people do that it legitimizes the social hierarchy that exists in a particular society. And those beliefs, we're really reluctant to give them up. And so they sort of reinforce the social hierarchy and allow it to continue over time. Uh, when I say that stratification exists in all societies, that could be because of social class. We could have a society that is stratified according to social class, according to race and ethnicity, according to gender and sexuality, according to age. You might also see societies that are stratified by religion or some other characteristic or set of groups. We in this lecture are going to focus on social class, race, ethnicity, and gender, while also recognizing that there are other axes of stratification uh, that are important. Your book talks about age. Sexuality is not really mentioned in your book, but that is certainly another axis of stratification, particularly in the United States. So let's first talk about what is social class. Um, we in sociology use this term somewhat interchangeably with another term, socioeconomic status, or SES for short. Basically, the difference here is that social class refers to um, sort of discrete groups, and socioeconomic, socioeconomic status assumes that people fall somewhere on a continuum. The idea is the same, and the distinction is not super important for what we're going to be doing, but just know that those terms are used interchangeably someone's social class or SES is, is complicated because there are a number of factors that play into one social class. So you have education, right? And you can think of education in a number of different ways. You could think about it in terms of the 
uh, number of years that you've spent in school. You could talk about it as um, the degree that you received. You could also think about it in terms of the type of education, public or private, the quality of education. Did you go to Harvard or did you go to a community college? Those kinds of aspects all play into social class. Also relevant is your occupation. So some occupations hold more prestige in our society than others. We tend to think of doctors and scientists and even professors as having a higher level of prestige than, say, people who work in sanitation or people who are cashiers at a grocery store typically don't have the same level of prestige in our society. So occupation plays a role in social class. Income and wealth are both very important. Income refers to the amount of money that you receive from your job. So we could think about that in terms of the hourly wage you get paid or the yearly salary you get paid. But also wealth is very important. Wealth is your net worth. So take everything that you own that is of monetary value, subtract out whatever you owe. That might include a car loan, a home loan, a student loan, and that number is your wealth. And what's important about wealth is that that gets passed down from generation to generation and it often accumulates. So the more wealth you have, the more likely it is that your your descendants will have more and more wealth to build on. Home ownership is also considered to be a component of social class. Um, home ownership is changing a little bit now because of the housing crisis that we saw in 2008, the housing bubble. Um, and I think it's becoming less of a marker of social class, but in general, particularly for older generations, buying a home was a marker that you were solidly in the middle class. And then having a safe neighborhood to live in or the kind of neighborhood that you live in also contributes to your social class. What kinds of resources do you have available to you in your neighborhood? Are you able to um, walk around? What are your property values like? Things like that. All of these components contribute to a person's social class or socioeconomic status. So now let's think about race and ethnicity. These are terms that are related but distinct. And your book will actually refer only to ethnicity. But when they do that, they are including what we typically think of as race. So I'll start with race. Race is a socially defined set of categories that are based on perceived or observable physical differences. So for often, we often point to skin color, hair texture, nose shape, eye shape, um, lip shape, physical features, oftentimes on the face, that suggest to us that somebody is of a particular race group. But beyond these external characteristics, race is really not biologically meaningful. So there is very little genetic difference between two individuals that we would classify in different race groups. So for example, between a white person and a black person, there's much less likely to be substantial genetic differences between those people than there would be between two people of any given race. So if we think of race as being a biological category, that would suggest that there would be obvious and consistent genetic differences between people of two different race groups. That is just not the case. And so in sociology, we think of race as not being particularly biologically meaningful because we create categories for race and sometimes we arbitrarily assign people to those categories. 
So this is especially true when you look historically at how white people and black people have been classified in the United States. At the end of the 1800s, you had a large group of immigrants coming from Europe, but from European countries that people who were already in America did not consider to be white. So you saw a large influx of people from Ireland, from Italy, um, a large influx of Jewish folks. And at that time, none of those people were considered to be white. Now, if you look at people who are of Irish, Jewish, or Italian descent today, we would almost exclusively categorize those people as white. So that's one way that race has changed over time and one way that we know that race is not really biological. It's something that we create socially. The other way that we know this or one example we can point to is that the way that we define who is black or African American in the United States has also changed. So it used to be that we actually had three categories or actually four categories for people of black racial descent. So you had people who were determined were 100% black, so they were considered to be black or African American. Then you had people with one parent who was black and one parent who was white, and that group of people was referred to as mulatto. You had people who had three black grandparents and one white grandparent. Those people would be referred to as quadroons, which is a terrible word. And then you had people who would have, let's say, seven African-American great-grandparents and one white grandparent, and those people would be referred to as octoroons. You could play around with the percentage. So perhaps you'd have somebody who had one black great-grandparent and seven white great-grandparents, and that person would still be considered octoroon. So we don't think about that in the same way now. We're actually much more likely to just classify somebody who appears to be black as black. But even those classifications are not always correct. So these are two little girls who are actually twins. So they came from the same parent, the same egg, but they look totally different. And if we were to see these girls out somewhere without knowing their background, we would assume not only that they weren't related, but that they are obviously of different races, which is not true because they have the same genetic material. So all of this is to say that we create race categories, but they are not biologically meaningful. That does not mean that they do not have an effect on our lives or on our health, as you'll see in the readings. Ethnicity is a little different. Ethnicity is also socially defined, but it's a category that's based on common language, religion, nationality, history, or another cultural factor. So oftentimes we will hear particularly white people, but also people who are Hispanic and people who are Asian talk about ethnicity. I'm Italian. I'm Jewish. I am Chinese. I am Japanese. I'm Korean. I'm Cuban. I'm Venezuelan. I'm Mexican. All of those are considered to be ethnicities because what ties people together is language, religion, history, nationality, culture, traditions, things like that. So our focus when we talk about race and ethnicity and how it relates to health is not so much on genetics. We are focused more on how race and ethnicity connect to access to resources and to experiences that we have in our lives that could ultimately influence our health. Then we can talk about gender, and in talking about gender, we should also talk about sex. So sex is 
categories that are based on physiological or bodily differences between males and females. So we think that this is pretty cut and dry, right? Either you have male body parts or you have female body parts. But as you read in your textbook, it's not always one or the other. A a small percentage of people in the United States and in the world are born what we would call intersex. So they are born with ambiguous genitalia. Now, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens when you have people who are born with obviously ambiguous genitalia, when it is obvious that their body parts, their genitalia, are not clearly male or female. That is sort of both. So this is in jest, but this picture is pointing to the idea that actually doctors want to determine a child's sex when that child is born if the genitalia is ambiguous. It has been the practice of physicians not to let a child leave the hospital with ambiguous genitalia or not to get very far in life with ambiguous genitalia. And so, for example, if a baby that is born with a very, very small penis, if that penis is small enough, the doctor will sometimes cut it and create a hole, a vagina, a fake vagina for that baby in order to maintain that two category situation to create a baby that is either male or female. So it's important to know that Sex is based on physical differences, physiological differences between males and females, but it's not always the case that children are born in either one or the other of those categories. Then if we talk about gender, gender is a set of categories that are based on socially constructed differences, meaning differences that we as a society come up with that are not based on sex, but that we use sex to inform. So Over time, we have developed a number of different ways that we identify as a man or a woman, ways that we present ourselves in masculine or feminine ways, and they are very tightly coupled with our sex identity, but they are not determined by our sex identity. We as a society create rules for how men and women should present themselves, how males and females should present themselves, and what exactly is masculine and feminine. Accordingly, we have gender roles for what men and women are supposed to do and how men and women are supposed to behave. These gender roles start at a very, very young age. You can see these little beanies here. When kids are born, we are very quick to assign boys to blue and girls to pink so that we know how to interact with those babies as they grow up. We know what kind of toys to buy them. We know what kind of cards to buy them in the grocery store, which are very gender segregated. We know to be tough with boys and to be sweet with girls, etc., etc. So this starts at a very early age, and that is all a social process. Now, as your book discusses, both sex and gender influence our health, right? There's the biological component of sex, and there's the social component of gender. We, for now, are going to concentrate on the social. And again, I want you to think, when we think about gender, think about how gender either provides or detracts from our access to resources and how it influences the kinds of experiences that we have in the social world and how those then will go on to influence our health. Okay, so now that we've covered the three main forms of stratification, I want to just talk briefly about how we might see stratification happen. So let me use this example of a totally fictitious group of people in four different occupational categories. So you have presidents of companies, you have managers within those companies, you have bank tellers, so let's say this is obviously a bank, And you have people who do maintenance and cleaning. Now, from the bottom to the top, you can see that resources like money, so income, 
prestige, power, and social capital increase the further up this ladder you go. But right now, they're just people. The people at the top have more resources, more resources than the people at the bottom. So within this occupation, there is a hierarchy. Now, it may be the case that the people who work in these positions are pretty evenly distributed in terms of social class background, race, and gender. So what you see here is an occupational hierarchy that has people at all levels from different races, genders, social class backgrounds. Now, I will say this is, I think, what we would consider to be the ideal situation, right? That people are equally distributed across these different categories. This is actually, though, not the typical case in America. Instead, what you have is a situation where you tend to see more males, which would be the blue stick figures, people who come from more affluent backgrounds, which would be the dark green people, whites, which would be the beige people. You tend to see those groups at the top of the hierarchy, and you tend to see disadvantaged social groups like people of color, people who come from poorer social backgrounds, and women towards the bottom of the hierarchy. Now, that has a lot to do with how we value groups of people. Again, going back to this idea that we have ideologies about which groups of people are deserving and which groups of people are not. And it tends to be the case that we, as a society, value or um, believe that people of higher social class backgrounds, men and white people, tend to belong at the top of the hierarchy. There is this sort of underlying belief that that order of things is the way that it should be. So as a result, when we feel that way, you tend to see those advantaged groups being higher on the prestige ladder and disadvantaged groups being lower on the prestige ladder. That is an example of how social stratification emerges for social class, race, and gender. This is a pretty exaggerated version, but it's not too far off from what we would see in your typical set of corporations. So I will move into two tables that I want to show you. The first looks at socioeconomic differences by race. So we might ask, well, how do we know that it's better economically to be in one group compared to another? Well, this is a set of data on the different uh, components of social class or socioeconomic status and looking at each component by race. So you'll notice that Native Americans are not included in this. There's often not enough data on those groups to include them. And so the data in this table come from Pew Research and from the Washington Post. And what you can see, if you look at all six rows, you've got the percent who've completed a college degree, household income, the poverty rate, amount of family wealth, the rate of home ownership, and the unemployment rate. You can see that for every component of SES, either Asian Americans or white Americans are at the top of the ladder. And for every component of SES, you have either black or Hispanic Americans at the bottom of the ladder. So for example, if you look at the percentage who have completed a college degree, over half of Asian Americans in 2015 had a college degree compared to only 36% of whites, 23% of blacks, and 15% of Hispanics. If you look at the unemployment rate, similarly, you can see that among Asian Americans, the unemployment rate is the lowest at 3.6%. 
and it's the highest among blacks at 10.3%. So when we talk about how closely correlated race and SES are, it's because you see this pattern for almost any indicator of socioeconomic status. You can also see how socioeconomic status might differ by gender when you look at different occupations and the income that is made by men and by women. So in this table, this was actually completed or, or the categories were suggested by students in an intro to sociology class last year. Some of these occupations tend to be more masculine, right, dominated more by men. Some of them tend to be more feminine or occupied more by women. And some of them we don't think of as really being more male or female. But what you can see is regardless of how many men or women are actually in the job, women are always making less money per week than their male counterparts on average. So among lawyers, for example, more men than women were lawyers. So this is numbers in thousands. So this is 446,000 men were lawyers in 2016 compared to 299,000 women. And yet men were bringing home much more money per week than women were. If you look at high school teachers, you actually had more women than men working in that position. The same is true for nurses, much higher rate, much higher number of women working as nurses compared to men. And yet, in both of those cases, women are still making slightly less money than men. This final column here is the ratio of women's income to men's income. If women in a particular category were making more than men on average, you would see this number higher than one. But in every single category here, women make less money than men, which means that the ratio is lower than one. So this number, for example, 81.3% means, sorry, 0.813 means that women only make 81.3% of what men make when they're working as construction and extraction, in construction and con extraction occupations. Here, if you look at physicians and surgeons, when you compare men and women, women are only making 63% of what men make when they are in the same physician or surgeon occupation. So that's a, a basic rundown of what stratification looks like in the US. Again, I think your book does a pretty good job of explaining then what health profiles look like for these groups and by age. Um, and so I will let the book and the reading speak for itself, but we'll focus in the next lecture on the theories of health inequality that are discussed in the readings this week.